Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for the third keynote lecture of the uh, first day of the World Congress on Thyroid Cancer. It is my distinct honor, my distinct pleasure, and my privilege to be able to introduce the next speaker. Um, but truthfully, he's a man who does not really require a lot of introduction because we all know him so well. And I don't think there's probably a single person in this audience who hasn't heard the name of Dr. Brian Haugen. Dr. Haugen is the Mary Ross Kern and Jerome H. Kern Chair of Endocrine Neoplasia at the uh, University of Colorado in Aurora, Colorado. And his um, uh, research interests have been broad-based and, uh, and detailed in molecular genetics behind uh, the development of thyroid neoplasms, both benign and malignant. Uh, he's had a major role, of course, most prominently recently in the American Thyroid Association guidelines, where he chairs the writing committee for the guidelines that were supposed to be 2012 and 2013, but finally 2015 guidelines. And I know that that was a difficult uh, gestation and delivery of those guidelines, and I admire you for the work that you did, Brian. Tremendous work. Uh, I'm sure the next set of guidelines is already underway, and we can't wait for the updates. But this afternoon, Dr. Haugen is going to be talking about surveillance and, and management of persistent and recurrent thyroid cancer, a deliberately broad-based topic to appeal to a, a deeply experienced speaker like himself. So, Brian Haugen, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian, and uh, thank you all for staying here in the afternoon and coming to this. Uh, I would like to say thank you for the title that the committee gave me, but this, this was quite daunting for me to sort of think about um, and sort of to approach on the surveillance, uh, base, uh, mainly the surveillance on patients with persistent or recurrent thyroid cancer. What should we be doing in this era, especially about thinking um, of trying to limit excess monitoring and managing of our patients as we've heard already throughout today and I think we'll hear throughout this conference. Um, these are my disclosures. And actually, this is my summary slide. It's not my last slide, but it's my summary slide. In a way, when we think about, and I want to focus more on imaging when we, when we are monitoring and managing our patients. And this is a, a really nice recent study from the SEER database looking at over 28,000 patients between 1998 and 2011. Um, and overall, there was a 4.1% death rate, and one of the questions was, is with disease-specific survival, did, how much imaging was there, and did imaging help disease-specific survival? And what you see here on the bottom in the blue is the death rate that's very low and fairly stable, and then you also see the uh, diagnostic rate of thyroid cancer, which is lower because of the high rate of imaging you see there that is just climbing dramatically. So we're seeing really a lot of imaging, and they focused on ultrasound imaging, radioiodine imaging, and PET scan imaging. And what they found was that ultrasound, doing recurrent ultrasound imaging led to a lot more surgery, but didn't lead to an improvement in disease-specific survival. Same thing for PET scanning as well, led to more therapy, but didn't lead to more disease-specific survival, improved disease-specific survival. Interestingly, radioiodine did. And it, it's, it's an association, and one of the thoughts possibly, whether it's that the radioiodine itself was effective or we were identifying these radioiodine avid patients who tended to do better. So this is still unclear, but one of the things we see in this is this really explosion of imaging that we're doing in our patients. And one of the conclusions that they had was this study provides the foundation needed to reassess thyroid cancer surveillance patterns and to curb unnecessary imaging. So how do we do this imaging and, and monitoring in our patients? Well, obviously, we start with radioiodine. And this really is, I think, something in our field that other fields are, are somewhat jealous of, that we have this sort of magic bullet for imaging. And we can see the patient on the right has uptake in the lungs, uptake in lymph nodes in the neck. This is a young man who actually now, 20-some years later, is doing very well after treatment with radioiodine. The patient on the left is a woman who has no radioiodine uptake but had pulmonary nodules 
picked up on CT scan for an elevated serum thyroglobulin. So we can see right away that the radioiodine is not necessarily good for finding disease, but it's good for finding disease that can be treated potentially with radioiodine. Obviously, another form of imaging we look at is, is axial imaging or CT scan, which is commonly used and can be used in the neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis um, in our patients when monitoring them for recurrence. The most common one we use is neck ultrasound. And this is where we're looking for abnormal nodules in the thyroid bed region, or more commonly abnormal lymph nodes on the top, a cystic lymph node that is almost certainly papillary thyroid carcinoma. On the bottom, one with peripheral vascularity that is indeterminate but somewhat suspicious um, for uh, recurrent thyroid cancer. So ultrasound is commonly used as well. We can use MRI imaging, and this is an example of a patient with a cervical spine lesion that is picked up with MRI imaging. And also brain imaging MRI is quite good for identifying disease in the brain. PET scan can be used commonly to especially identify disease in patients who are radioiodine negative. Um, and this can be not only used for identifying disease, but for prognostication. And then also other uh, nuclide imaging, such as bone imaging, can be used in patients suspected of bone metastases, although we do find that MRI imaging is probably uh, better than um, some of the scintigraphy that we have. So when we think about monitoring and differentiated thyroid carcinoma, I kind of put this into three buckets. One is the tumor marker serum thyroglobulin. This is a tumor marker, and it basically is asking the question, is there still potentially disease around? In a patient with antibody negative, now with our sensitive thyroglobulin, if it's low in a majority of cases, that's a very good sign saying that there is unlikely to have persistent thyroid cancer. Then we go to our anatomic imaging when we say, where is it? Or really the flip side of, is it in the neck? Is it in the chest? We do our guided imaging to, to find this through anatomic imaging. And then our functional imaging can be helpful, not necessarily, again, on just finding disease, but ask what's it doing. Radioiodine imaging, if it's taking up radioiodine, we know that's a good uh, prognostic sign, and also we can potentially treat them with radioiodine. FDG PET imaging, again, can find radioiodine, potentially refractory disease that can give us prognosis and help guide some directed therapies or systemic therapies in that case. So that's how we kind of think about these tools that we're using. Neck ultrasound is very good for anterior nodes in the neck and is one of the best imaging techniques for characteristics of these lymph nodes to look for benign, indeterminate, or suspicious lymph nodes. Also can look at soft tissue in the thyroid bed region, but it's not so good at deep structures in the neck, high up in the neck, or in the upper chest. That's where we rely more on CT scanning. CT scanning of the neck, generally we need to do this with contrast to get the best imaging. Chest, if we're just looking in the lungs, uh, does not necessarily need um, contrast imaging, but the mediastinum, we really rely on that. And then other soft tissues, the liver can be uh, also examined using a three-phase contrast. Radioiodine whole body scan, again, is quite good for identifying disease. It can be treated with radioiodine, but as I'll just show you in a minute, it's not the best test necessarily to say, does the patient have persistent disease? And then MR scans, which can be useful in many patients. And a lot of times we focus on the bone, the liver, and the brain when we do MRI scanning. We can do other, we can do it of the neck, but I think many of us are more comfortable with CT scanning in the neck. And then finally, PET, identifying new disease that may be missed by these other modalities when the testing with imaging does not match the tumor marker. It can be used for prognosis, can be used to target treatment of PET avid lesions that may be threatening, not very good, obviously, for brain metastases in many of our patients because of the activity we see in the brain. So when we talk about sensitivity for detection of disease, this is an older slide that I've used, but I think still is very uh, apt for when we think about this is for many years we really focused on the diagnostic whole body scan. And again, as I said, it still has some utility. And you see the first two bars actually are when the gold standard was a therapeutic dose of radioiodine. So it's fairly good at identifying something that could be found with a therapeutic dose of radioiodine. The next three studies you see there, the lower bars, and the third one actually is at zero, is when you're using other imaging modalities, CT scan, ultrasound, PET scan. How good is that whole body scan at identifying disease? Not as good. 
So it's just better to identify disease that could be treated with radioiodine. The sensitive thyroglobulin, this could be in the older days when we had the first generation of thyroglobulin that maybe needed um, uh, recombinant TSH stimulation or withdrawal stimulation, or now these second generation assays that are very sensitive, using a sensitive thyroglobulin can be quite good, but it's not 100%. Same thing with neck ultrasound. Obviously, and again, this is focusing on our low to intermediate risk patients. Um, it's quite good, but it's not 100%. And in our low to intermediate risk patients, many of them we can identify disease if we put together a sensitive thyroglobulin and a neck ultrasound. Obviously, this is different for our higher risk patients. So when we've set a monitoring plan, we need to really do, and, and we kind of do this with each of our patients, um, is to do three things, is to look at the stage, look at the risk of recurrence, and look at the response to therapy to help set our um, follow-up plan and imaging plan in these patients. Now, I think many of you have begun to get comfortable with the uh, seventh edition of the TNM AJCC uh, staging system, and so now we have an eighth uh, edition of that system that I think many people have heard about that is going to be implemented in January of 2018 here in the United States. And there are some big changes that I just want to show you. And this is a, a paper that Mike Tuttle led that compared the seventh and the eighth editions. And as you can see, stage one, the big change, one of the big changes is age 55 instead of 45. Um, and other than that, for stage one, it's, uh, for uh, patients under the age of 55, now it's the same. Under age 55, if you don't have distant METs, stage one. If you do have distant METs, stage two. But it's a different now age cutoff. Even though it's acknowledged, this is more of a continuous variable and not an absolute cutoff. And you can see the 10-year um, disease-specific survival for the seventh edition versus the eighth edition. And one big change is patients who are now stage two have a poorer prognosis. Uh, it used to be that the two were very close, and now there's a poorer prognosis, uh, which is, this is a survival staging system. And then our older patients then go to that more classic stage one through four. And again, we can see the age 55 cutoff, but another big cutoff in stage one is less than four centimeters. Two to four centimeters used to be stage two. Also, lymph node disease. Any lymph node disease has been moved into stage two even in our older patients, as well as gross extrathyroidal extension. This is primarily into fat or muscle. We can see then if we have gross extrathyroidal extension into other soft tissue structures, that moves patients into stage three. And then now we just have 4A and B. You remember there was 4A, B, and C? Now there's just 4A and B. 4A used to be 4B, which is where we now are in the prevertebral fascia or the carotid arteries, but again, age 55. And then stage 4B is distant metastatic disease. And you can again see the predicted survival in each of those groups. It has been further divided out than the seventh edition. There have been a number of studies now to try to start asking questions and looking at their databases to say, how good, are, how good is this at predicting survival? And this is out of a Korean um, group of patients of over 3,000 patients. On the left is uh, the seventh edition, and on the right is the eighth edition. And interestingly, even though they moved from 60% of patients in stage one to now 80% of patients in stage one, survival didn't almost change at all. So stage one still does very well, even though we have many more patients there. You can see that stage two does a bit worse, because we're really moving a lot of those patients who were in stage three and even 4A uh, into this group. Stage three, that's probably one of the biggest differences we see. In the seventh edition, at least according to this, they were all very similar. But now this is quite different. And then we see 4A and 4B. So this probably better separates uh, survival. So I do think this, it's going to take some getting used to in this uh, new system. But this does help separate uh, for survival. Well, what about recurrence risk? And again, you've heard already at this meeting, and we'll probably hear more about, is this sort of three-stage system that first came into the 2009 guidelines, the low risk, intermediate, and high risk. And I won't go into those details. At that time, it was more put in as an idea. There really wasn't a lot of data supporting that. And so there have been some studies that have come out since then to ask, well, how good is this at predicting recurrence? Staging is good for survival. How good is this at predicting recurrence? Well, the low-risk patients ended up 80 to 90 percent of them in these studies had no evidence of disease at follow-up, whereas only 2 to 7 percent had structural incomplete response to therapy. Intermediate risk is lower no evidence of disease, 50 to 60 percent, and higher structural incomplete response. 
And then the high risk really has a fairly low, no evidence of disease, although we can achieve that in some patients, but many of them ended up having structural incomplete. So what this did was validated uh, this system for recurrence, estimating recurrence risk, and this is why we have it as a strong recommendation based on moderate quality evidence. And now what we've done is, one of the big things we've done too with that is that risk of recurrence is lymph nodes used to all be in the intermediate risk and now they've been moved into both the low risk, the intermediate, and the high risk uh, based on either lymph node involvement, size of the tumor in the lymph node, or extranodal extension. And many of you again remember this where we have this sort of continuum and we originally actually put lines in there trying to cut off low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk we couldn't agree on where those lines would go and realized it was a continuum, so we left it without lines, and that's why some people would, where your cutoff is for lower intermediate risk could be different. So with that as a background, I just want to present a 39-year-old male um, who had some increased neck pain, had a CT scan of his neck, and had a mass lesion in the cervical spine uh, 6, C6. Biopsy was follicular thyroid carcinoma. Bone scan showed lesions in both C6 and T6. He had surgery and stabilization for uh, C6 and external beam radiotherapy to both of these lesions. Had a thyroidectomy and interestingly just had a five millimeter follicular carcinoma in there, but it did have vascular invasion. He would be a stage two whether you do seventh or eighth edition, but he would be at high risk for persistent or recurrent disease. We're worried about this young man with his bone metastases. So here we have stage two, high risk for recurrence. He was, um, had a whole body scan done to look for radioiodine avid disease. And interestingly, he still had significant uptake in C6 and T6. Um, and you can see his very high thyroglobulin, but no uptake anywhere else. Received radioiodine. Post-therapy scan shows some uptake where the thyroid used to be. Definitely had significant uptake in C6 and T6, but did not have other metastatic disease. Three months later, he had CT imaging from his neck down to his pelvis and really only had those two lesions that were following. Eight months later, he had again come back with a radioiodine whole body scan, still showed uptake in C6 and T6. And that thyroglobulin you see was much lower but still was there, was treated again with radioiodine, had the same uptake, had a bone scan that just showed again some uptake in the C6 and T6 lesions, but not other uptake. Six months later, still had this persistent thyroglobulin of 20. Fortunately, his complete blood count is normal. And two years after his initial therapy, still had a significantly positive thyroglobulin um, with a suppressed TSH. And when he again was uh, imaged with low-dose radioiodine, had a high thyroglobulin, and there still was uptake in these lesions. Amazingly, he got a third dose of radioactive iodine. This was a little while ago. Still, his complete blood count is normal. But his thyroglobulin, you can see, has come down. A year after that, he had one more whole body scan diagnostic, but now had no uptake, but still a significantly elevated thyroglobulin, and a PET scan was negative. So really now, this, he's moved into this incomplete biochemical response um, in this patient with a, still a high thyroglobulin, but no obvious disease progression um, or active disease that we see in those two areas. So how good is a PET scan in a patient like this who had a suppressed thyroglobulin of 12? Well, if you look at a number of studies of the optimal thyroglobulin for PET sensitivity and specificity, it's somewhere between 10 and maybe 20 or 30. If you're much below that, and this is why we don't usually recommend, especially in low to intermediate risk patients with a low thyroglobulin, of moving to a PET scan too early, because you have a higher likelihood of finding something nonspecific than you do of finding significant disease. And this is sort of where our patient was versus the patient on the right who had Herthel cell carcinoma and a thyroglobulin of over 3,000. So we did stage recurrence risk, and now we do this response to therapy. And this is, again, something that has come out more in the 2015 guidelines about looking for a, doing this dynamic risk assessment. And this, you can have an excellent response, and I think we're all getting comfortable with that, very low tumor marker, 
absent antibodies. If imaging is done, you don't see anything on imaging, we lower that risk estimate. If they have an indeterminate or a good response, they still have some measurable tumor marker or maybe antibodies, but really don't have structural disease. And then there's this incomplete response, either biochemical as our patient, or structural if we have something that we can clearly measure in these patients. And that would then raise your risk estimate again of this person having persistent or recurrent disease. And this is just one example of that, again, from Mike Tuttle's group, looking in yellow at their initial ATA risk stratification, low, intermediate, and high. And then in pink, if you had an excellent response, that drops. But it started very low at low risk. I think intermediate risk is where we use this the best. That can drop. If you have a good or an indeterminate response, you have stable risk estimate. And again, if you have an incomplete response, you have a higher risk estimate. And you can see in our patient who started out high risk and still has an incomplete response, he still has a high risk of persistent or recurrent disease, although biochemical is better than structural. So what the recommendations have been is to really tailor our therapy and our monitoring according to that response to therapy, especially in our low to intermediate risk patients. And you can see the TSH target changes, how often we consider measuring the serum thyroglobulin, neck ultrasound, do we do a stimulated thyroglobulin, whole body scan, and cross-sectional imaging. And the higher the structural incomplete response, we're more aggressive with our suppression, with our monitoring, with the frequency of monitoring and the tools that we use um, in monitoring for these patients, and probably even a bit more aggressive for our high-risk patients. So we'll come back to this patient, but I think most of our patients end up in that low to intermediate risk category. And again, there's some algorithms in the guidelines that talk about what do we do for these patients who are sort of in this low to intermediate risk group. Well, one thing when we consider, again, doing something like a whole body scan, if we have a patient who's lower intermediate risk, especially in a patient who, if they got treated with radioiodine, the post-therapy scan showed uptake only in the bed and not anywhere else, and you didn't have a high thyroglobulin, there really is not much utility in continuing doing a diagnostic scan. In the patients who have the higher risk of disease or abnormal post-therapy scans, this is where we can utilize that follow-up diagnostic whole body scan as we did in this gentleman. The follow-up ultrasound. This is a whole nother area too. How often do we do it and for how long do we do ultrasounds in our patients who have achieved an excellent response to therapy? Again, if we find disease, we need to keep monitoring it. But what about those low to intermediate risk patients um, uh, who have achieved an excellent response to therapy. How often should we do it? Do we ever stop in these patients? And this was an interesting cost-effective analysis of long-term uh, uh, follow-up on patients, whether they're going to have a yearly ultrasound or they move to every three-year ultrasound. Um, and this is one of these Monte Carlo simulations of many different uh, parameters uh, and sensitivity analyses. This was a 45-year-old female, two-centimeter papillary carcinoma, and right away now, in 2017, we can say, well, should the patient have gotten a thyroidectomy? Got a thyroidectomy, did get radioiodine. We've been discussing, should a patient like this get radioiodine? And has had an excellent response to therapy. At one year follow-up, had a negative neck ultrasound, stimulated thyroglobulin that was low. Did we need to do that? And a negative thyroglobulin antibody. And so again, what this paradigm did was, for five years, the patient would get a follow-up neck ultrasound, and then move to either continued yearly or every three years. And really what this is kind of just part of the analysis, and you can see all the dots in that upper right-hand corner are basically showing in that simulation, no matter what simulation you did, it was much more cost-effective to stretch out that monitoring in this patient who's had an excellent response than it was to continue to do yearly uh, uh, annual uh, ultrasound reviews. The group from Memorial Sloan Kettering kind of came at it a different way and looked at a group of patients who had low risk disease um, and did have surgery plus minus radioiodine who were followed up for a good amount of time, median of eight years, and then had a median of six follow-up ultrasounds, ranging from two to 17. Interestingly, 114 of them, or two-thirds of them, had an indeterminate or atypical ultrasound. Only one of them was structural disease found. So here, we're maybe raising anxiety in ourselves and our patients by doing a lot of this imaging in these low to intermediate risk patients with an excellent response compared to disease that we're finding that we can do something about. 
So this is another way sort of of looking at how often and how much should we be doing that. So when we think about that, though, we look at guidelines, we look at the literature, and this was a really nice study by Megan Haymart and colleagues looking at the variation in management of thyroid cancer. And this equation is actually in that paper. I can't tell you how they, what this equation is, but this basically looks sort of at the variability when they, when they uh, questioned a large number of specialists. Actually, the most were surgeons, next were endocrinologists, and next were nuclear medicine specialists about management, all sorts of management issues, but I want to talk about follow-up. Interestingly, one question they asked was, did you read the ATA guidelines, 2009, because this is an older paper, and the NCCN guidelines? First of all, I like this that they had uh, 76% did read the ATA guidelines. I don't know what the other 24% were doing. Um, and 31% read the NCCN guidelines. And they looked at to say, reading the guidelines, did that really change what people did as far as the uh, uh, variability? And the answer was no. So this is an example with thyroid hormone replacement. And down in the lower right, this is a patient. What would you do to, would you suppress a TSH with, um, levothyroxine if they had distant metastatic disease, and the lower it is, the uh, more, uh, 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 or the less variability there was. The lower this bar is, the less variability. So people would agree on that. But you can see in low risk, would you suppress the TSH, there was a tremendous amount of variability. And really across all the questions in long-term management, there was a lot of variability, partly because we don't have a lot of good studies in this area. So back to our patients who had higher risk disease, incomplete biochemical response to therapy. Well, I partly bring him up because we do have a five-year follow-up after his last therapy. And remember, that was two years into his, into his disease. He had a PET CT that really didn't show any disease. His thyroglobulin was a little bit lower on levothyroxine suppression therapy. He did not receive any more radioiodine, even though he had a positive thyroglobulin. At 10 years, what this is also was interesting to me, when I first saw him, he said to me, he says, you know, I'd really like to be able to see my daughter graduate from uh, college. And so 10 years after his last therapy, 12 years into this, he saw his daughter graduate from college and his tumor marker was a little bit lower. And I even, as of about three months ago, have 15 year follow up on him, uh, where his daughter got married. And his thyroglobulin is even a bit lower. He still has a biochemical incomplete response to therapy. And so I think, in my mind, when I think about these patients, whether it's an excellent response or even some of these who have an indeterminate or a biochemical incomplete, I think we're missing one more piece of those three pieces of stage, recurrence, and response to therapy. And what we're missing is time. Time since your last therapy. And so that's one thing I think that we've been trying to do more is say, how long has it been since this patient has had to have therapy? Even if they have a biochemically incomplete response, they're probably going to do better than someone who's only six months out this patient who's 15 months out with a stable, relatively low thyroglobulin. And so when we think about this, I think in that excellent response, we need to start asking the question, at some point, can we stop? Stop doing monitoring on these patients. And I think we need more research in that area. And then also, even in the biochemically incomplete and the, and the uh, indeterminate, once we get to a certain point, can we start backing off? on what we're doing on these patients? And I think the answer is yes, but again, I think we need more studies um, in this area. But I think that time component is something that's uh, very important to consider uh, in our patients. So finally, I'll come back to this, and I think, I don't know if Megan Haymart's here, but I think I've quoted like a bunch of her studies. She should have maybe been up here giving this talk. But Megan, Julianne, and a number of other uh, uh, folks from Michigan and Duke really did a nice recent review in endocrine reviews on controversies in the management of low-risk differentiated thyroid cancer. And they do talk about long-term surveillance. When can we stop? How often should we be doing it in our patients? And one interesting thing I think they said was low-risk patients who have an excellent response after five years, maybe we can discharge them to the primary care physician with yearly thyroglobulin and TSH. Now, I don't know how many of you out there, when I try to send someone to a primary care and I tell them to do a thyroglobulin and interpret it, I kind of get some pushback on that. And I think what we need to be able to do is to start educating maybe some of our primary care colleagues who are interested in this and could be our partners. Because I don't know if we need to be continually seeing a lot of these patients who had an excellent response to therapy, but somebody does and we maybe need to work with our colleagues in primary care a bit more and educate them on these measures.
And then what they mentioned, I think it's important, is these areas of study. Five to 10 years retrospective or prospective studies. We need longer term studies to say, when can we stop or when can we really lengthen this follow up? Um, what is the need for long term imaging, thyroglobulin measurement in these patients? And really, what is the cost effectiveness? Because I think one of our concerns is the false positives, especially with our imaging and with our ultrasound imaging in these patients. And then another big area that is, we're starting to study, but we need to continue to get better on, is patient anxiety and patient satisfaction with all of this that we're doing for our patients. So I think we need to think about these concepts and maybe come back to a meeting like this and hopefully present um, at these meetings uh, some new findings. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Haugen, for a truly masterful survey of a broad and complex area. I think we all benefited from that hugely. From the, on behalf of the steering committee of the Third World Congress on Thyroid Cancer, we really appreciate your keynote speech. Thank you. Thank you. Your cap is on. Cap is on. <laughs> it's kind of basic. <laughs>